This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. As I recall this video in 2022, Planes, Trains and Automobiles is receiving its 35th anniversary and is getting a 4K re-release, complete with the legendary long lost deleted scenes that run almost as long as the movie itself does. So what better time to talk about arguably John Hughes's best movie, or at least my personal favourite out of the ones he's directed. The genesis of planes, trains and automobiles apparently came from a hellish travel experience that Hughes himself suffered going from New York to Chicago, getting diverted to Wichita and ended up spending the best part of five days getting to his intended location. Hughes, a legendarily fast writer, transferred his experiences to the page and made it an even more grueling, farcical experience. The project marks a departure for Hughes, who by that point was best known for his Brat Pack comedies including Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The dealt with the experiences of teenagers with unusual compassion and relatability that made them almost instant classics. If anything that's leaned towards more adult projects was a return to Hughes's earlier writing credits on movies like National Lampoon's Vacation and Mr. Mom. Both Planes, Trains and Automobiles and She's Having a Baby were produced concurrently. The two films are not only linked by Bacon's early cameo in Planes, racing to beat Steve Martin's Neil Page to catch a cab in New York, but also later we hear the argument between Bacon and Elizabeth McGovern's characters in Baby playing on the television that Neil Page's wife watches at home. But what if the shoe was on the other foot? I go Barefoot! But the film didn't just mark a turning point for Hughes, but also that of its two leads. Martin was largely known for his stand-up comedy that he channeled into a madcap persona in a series of comedies for Carl Reiner, including The Jerk, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, and The Man With Two Brains. Martin had tried to attempt more dramatic roles with a role in the Dennis Potter adaptation Pennies From Heaven, but like Bill Murray, his transition into drama wouldn't stick until later. In 1987, both Plains and Roxanne saw Martin starts to transition towards more grounded characters in his comedies, and a more sophisticated, mature approach in their humour. Martin's Neil Page especially feels like a direct line to characters in later comedies like Parenthood or The Father of the Bride remake in its sequel that cast Martin as relatable family men going through a series of exaggerated disasters drawn from real life. However, the real revelation was John Candy. Candy had become increasingly famous moving from sketch show SCTV to playing comic foils and sidekicks in films films like Brewster's Millions and Splash. In Splash, there's a moment near the end of it that seems to foreshadow his later work in Planes, where his comic O suddenly has a speech chastising his brother for not chasing his love. People fall in love every day, huh? Well, that's a crock. Look, do you realize how happy you were with her? Some people will never be that happy. I'll never be that happy! In Planes, Hughes takes Candy further, finding debts previously unexplored. His Dale Griffith is almost desperate to please, the point of being suffocating, but what's lying just beneath the surface is an incredibly deep sense of sadness. It's a role that redefined Candy, and he quickly became one of Hughes' most regular collaborators, given center stage in his next directorial outing, Uncle Buck, as well as appearing in several more films that Hughes wrote and produced over the next few years. But his role in subsequent vehicles like Buck or Only the Lonely also try to tap into some of that emotion underneath Candy's persona, and given his tragically early death, a lot of his career has a distinctly bittersweet quality in retrospect. This is something that film critic Roger Ebert especially noticed in his review of the absolutely dismal Wagons East, the movie that Candy died during filming, Ebert noted that an element of melancholy crept into some of Candy's later films. Years later, when he would re-review Planes, he would recount how we once encountered John Candy in a New York bar depressed, and how a lot of the reason for Candy's success in the part was because there's a lot of truth in the role. Candy's vulnerability becomes its most disarming asset. Martin and Candy make for an exceptional comic duo. Although spiritually their visual contrast evokes Laurel and Hardy, and the road movie aspect Hope and Crosby, the film achieves the rare trick of using both to their fullest potential. In most comedies there's a straight man and a funny man, but in Planes I'd argue that Candy and Martin get to be both, depending on what the scene requires. They both get to do plenty of physical comedy, they each get their equal share of the film's funniest lines, they both get their own dramatic moments, and they both try to adjust a malfunctioning car seat. Neither upstages the other, they are a team from beginning to end, bringing out the best from one another. Neil and Dell are two people brought together from completely different worlds, and the class element is 
is a big cause of friction in their relationship. Neil comes from an upper middle class background as an advertising executive and given the inspiration behind the film is an analogue for Hughes himself who had the same job before he became a filmmaker. But Neil has become so privileged that he quickly loses his temper when things don't go his way. Neil is frustrated at Dell before he's even met him. He trips over his trunk trying to catch a cab and then Dell steals another while he's being extorted by the passenger. So he's in a very bad mood when the flight is delayed. He gets put in economy instead of the first class that he booked, stuck next to someone he barely tolerates. Everything about the first act of the movie is designed to grind away at Neil to the point where he finally snaps and rants at Dell about how insufferable he finds him. Dell's famous monologue not only disarms Neil from the fight that he's trying to pick, but also shakes him and the audience. Previously, we've only seen Dell from Neil's perspective as an irritant, and this is our first glimpse of Dell's own. It's the first of many reminders of empathy that Neil has to learn. Neil flies into rages several times during planes, but it never gets him anywhere. The infamous car rental scene may be hysterical, but he's still fucked. Antagonizing the cabbie outside gets him a punch in the face for his troubles. It's only when he shows up at the second motel, humble to the point of haggling for a room desperately, does he actually succeed, largely by pawning the only thing still of value on him, his watch. The class element is quite prominent in that scene as Dell attempts to do the same, but fails because he only has a cheap Casio. Dell, on the other hand, has clearly led a life on the road and has done so for some time. Rewatch the film and note just how many times Dell seems to know someone that can help him out of a bind. He's good friends with the owner of the first motel, and that's the first of several instances where he calls in a favour. He may sell shower curtain rings, but he's a good salesman, and Candy makes you believe that this person could be friends with anyone. The scene where he sells the rings as fashion accessories to make some petty cash is a great example of Candy's improvisation and Dell's resourcefulness. He's clearly not as rich as Neil, even before we find out he's homeless, but he's a far better traveller with a common touch that Neil has lost along the way. We see this in the scene on the bus where Neil fails to start a rendition of Three Coins in the Fountain, so Dale recovers by starting the Flintstones theme song, which of course everyone knows. On subsequent watches, I feel that these kind of details give heavy hints at how Dale has managed to survive by himself for so long, going from place to place and using his abilities as a salesman to just about get by. And once Dale's secret is revealed, even his more slovenly habits like washing his underwear and socks in the bathroom sink take on a different light. The scene where Neil confesses that his work is taking too much time away from his family, where Dell crucially slips that he hasn't been home in years, is where the loneliness of the road starts to become truly apparent. Neil is desperate to get back to his family, his wife and his young kids, because that's time he won't get back, and Dell is a dark reflection of what Neil could become, a man who has lost everything and the road has become his life. There's something heartwarming and heartbreaking about the way the two men genuinely love their wives, something which you very rarely see in these kind of films where women are often portrayed as nags and they long for that emotional comfort, especially Dell, and they end up providing that to each other instead in their absence. Naturally there's the those are pillows scene, but these are two people that form a bond over their experience because they need each other. Compare the tension of their first night in the motel to the summer count looseness of the second as they become more comfortable in each other's company. Neil and Dell each have things that the other does not, and they can't make it alone, and every time that Neil tries to leave Dell behind, fate brings them back together. Dell's signature heavy trunk and obvious symbolism of the weight of his grief for his late wife is key to this. When the train breaks down, Neil spots Dell struggling to carry it by himself and help him, foreshadowing when he will do the same at the film's conclusion. Simply put, it's a load that they both need to carry together. One of the things that stands out about planes, trains and automobiles is how authentic it feels. Hughes' script was notoriously long for a comedy 145 pages, to compare most are around 90 for equivalent screen time, and Martin discovered when he met Hughes they had no intention of trimming it down. By all accounts they filmed every bit of it, and a whole lot more, much to the frustration of editor Paul Hirsch, where it was not uncommon for a take to span an entire reel of film and 
and continue on the next while the camera is being reloaded. The result was an enormous amount shot, as well as escalating costs and delays from chasing the wintry weather, as well as the fact that Hughes actually built sets for much of Neil's house, even though that frustrated Paramount executives and a loss of that footage barely even made the final movie. But I'd argue that attention to detail informs the movie, giving it a lived-in quality, as the endless parade of anonymous waiting areas, travel cabins, and garishly attired budget accommodation will be familiar to anyone who has spent a lot of time travelling, with only Hughes' signature hint of cartoonish exaggeration. This is no accident, as many people have tracked down the various locales where the film was shot, as the movie used many actual locations, Planes is by far the most sprawling of Hughes' work, and makes you feel like you're on the road in the same way the characters are. Much of this deleted footage has been speculated upon for years, especially thanks to the great video by Joe Ramoni, who I think is at least partially responsible for Paramount finally unearthing the footage, which we will at last get a chance to see. But I'd argue that most of these deletions were actually for the best. Ordered by Paramount to bring it down to 90 minutes, Planes was hacked to the bone, but it benefited from that because there's scarcely a wasted moment in the movie. Unlike the characters, the film is constantly moving forward and extremely disciplined despite the unruly production. Some of these deleted scenes would have actually undermined the film. A subplot where Neil's wife suspects that he's having an affair was a wisely eliminated distraction, even if it makes some of the calls home abrupt. Likewise, a scene late in the film where Neil and Dale get into an argument outside of a courthouse after their burnt-out car is towed away and Neil punches Dale in the face after he reveals that he didn't buy insurance would have disrupted the natural thaw in their relationship after their stay in the second motel room. The cost of a continuity error in that Dale now has an unexplained black eye is a small price to pay to protect the growth of the characters. But perhaps the biggest example of this is the ending. Air to Hirsch has explained that much of the famous ending was actually constructed out of repurposed footage. The shots of Steve Martin on the train are actually him between takes from a scene that was deleted otherwise, and the shots that he's thinking of of Thanksgiving dinner with his wife are actually taken from the film's original final scene. Apparently Dale followed Neil to his stop originally, something which you might actually notice if you've ever rode on the L train in Chicago before, because they don't have this kind of waiting area that Neil confronts Dell in. You much likelier find this in a stop in suburban Illinois. There's a shot I love, which is this one, which is the train pulling back into the station as Neil returns. Now you could say that this is obviously an error, as this is clearly reversed footage of the train leaving the station, but I like to read it that Neil is almost turning back time to try and fix the mistake of leaving Dell behind. Originally after Dell's admission, he would have a lengthy morgue where he explains to Neil more about his situation, a cut that was lamented by Steve Marcin as that contains some of Candy's best acting. However, it's a darling that Hughes wisely got rid of, because honestly, I don't think the film needs it. Candy's revelation and the expressions on the two actors' faces are all the audience needs before the film smash cuts to them walking together towards Neil's home in one of the most powerful, cathartic edits in any movie I can think of. It is a shame that we lost Candy's performance, but it's a cut that cements the film's compassion and friendship in a visual instant that says exactly what it needs to. I myself have been spending a lot of time travelling lately, going back and forth between London and especially, and it reminded me how much travelling can be a frantic, stressful, and ultimately lonely experience. You're in a transitory state, you're neither where you started nor where you're going, you're somewhere in between, and you have to put your faith in the transport to get you where you want to go. You have to surrender control to the delays and unforeseen mishaps that could get in your way. I have to admit I've spent a lot of time thinking about planes, trains, and automobiles lately, and how it still holds up to this day is how much it encapsulates this universal experience. Hughes, Candy, and Martin were three great comic talents at the top of their game, but the movie's longevity isn't simply because it's funny, but because it's genuinely touching about our desire for connection at the same time. We may feel low on our travels, but we're surrounded by others doing the same on their own journeys, joined together for a time, and for better or for worse, we never know who we're getting on board with. The film is one of the few successful Thanksgiving movies Movies, but in many ways, it's about stopping from the hustle and bustle of our lives to be thankful for what we have and our connections. 
and thank goodness that we're bloody home at the end of it. As you can probably surmise from this essay, I like movies that take me on a journey, and this piece of art does the same. This is a movie palette. It takes your favourite movies and turns them into a piece of artwork like this. Each of these individual lines represent scenes or sequences from the movie, so you can retrace the movie in your mind's eye. That's very fitting for a road movie like Planes, Trains and Automobiles, which of course is available from Movie Palette. Although in this case, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you would like one of your own, go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off and start your cinematic journey. If you like this essay and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or my YouTube Super Thanks feature, which is right below the video, or you can buy some merch at my Tee Public page or you can support me on Patreon where you can see my videos early or gain access to my Discord server or simply like, share and subscribe. Those all help as well. Until next time, I'm Matthew Burke, fading out.